Hello everybody. A few years ago, Audi broke with tradition when they released a version of their flagship supercar, the R8, without their trademark Quattro all-wheel drive system. It was a limited edition car and I have to say that everybody at the time was very excited about it. After all, when Lamborghini had done a similar thing with the Gallardo a few years earlier and introduced the Balboni to the world, they created a legend. Unfortunately, I think it's fair to say that the rear wheel series R8 fell pretty flat. Prices dropped just as quickly as with any other R8 and I'd say history was very quick to forget it. Audi, however, haven't and so the rear wheel drive R8 is back. This one is called, more simply, the Rear Wheel Drive, or RWD. Unlike the Rear Wheel Series, it's not a limited production car. This is simply the cheapest way to get yourself into a brand new R8. And I've managed to get Audi to give this one to me for about three weeks. You see, the Rear Wheel Series, I only drove for about 20 minutes and didn't really think it was that great, but that's simply not long enough to really get a good feel for a car. This one has no excuses, and I'm going to use the time for a little bit of a celebration of the R8 and the supercar in general. So over the next month you're going to see a whole bunch of R8 and supercar related videos from me, which I hope you're all going to enjoy. And don't worry, plenty of normal content is going to be put in there as well to keep you occupied if this isn't really your thing. So, what is it about the R8 rear-wheel drive that separates it from the rest of the lineup? Fundamentally, it's the same car, really, as any other current R8, meaning it shares a lot of the same problems. Doors that never seem to want to shut. Doors which don't shut that easily. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, I promise. Well, why does this one work? doors which don't shut as easily as they should. A boot which is still disappointingly small and annoyingly hasn't gotten any bigger despite the fact that all of the front wheel drive stuff of course is no longer here. And far too many fake vents. Exhaust tips which are stupidly big. And an interior trimmed in what I can only describe as an old gardening glove. Of course, this being the base model, there are also some things that they've taken away. For example, the side blades are now colour-coded. I don't really think they look any worse for it. Your sole braking option is these steel wavy discs, and in front of those you'll find only 19-inch wheels. The headlights are pretty basic by Audi standards too. They're LEDs, but there's no laser function, no matrix system on them. In fact, these ones don't even have auto dimming. The only option which has actually been specced on this car, and pretty much one of the very few options you can actually have on a rear wheel drive, is the B&O sound system. Of course, there are also quite a few things which are no different at all to any other R8, and they include the amazing aluminium and carbon fibre chassis which sit at this car's heart, and of course the same body shell assembled in the same plant by a process which is actually very manual compared to any other Audi. The mighty 5.2 litre Audi V10 engine is also here present and correct, and I firmly believe that this is one of the greatest engines ever to make its way into a road car. In fact, this engine is pretty much exactly the same as you'll find in many of Audi's race cars. They don't really change anything. Now, in the range topping performance, it makes 620 horsepower. In the current Quattro, 570 but here it's detuned to about 540 horsepower. But don't worry, if you're really desperate to have that sort of 600 horsepower number, I'm pretty convinced that all the ponies they've taken away from here were done in software. So if you wanna get this up to full fighting strength, I don't think it would be that difficult. That engine is mated to the sole gearbox offering, which is a seven speed S-Tronic. All round, a very good gearbox. And now we come to what is by far the worst part of any modern R8, the interior. And how do you frustrate me so much with this car? In truth, this base level car isn't really any different from the top of the range performance, aside from the fact that that one gets bucket seats as standard. What annoys me is the fact that the shape in here is brilliant. I love the simplicity of it, the purity of it. This was one of the first cars to get a virtual cockpit as standard, and it works so well. You've got one nice, clear, high-resolution display here. You can control it either from the steering wheel 
or from the physical dials down here, and that's it. Heater controls, three rotary dials, they can do everything you need. This is absolutely perfect. Where it falls over is in the choice of materials. You've got the aforementioned gardening glove, then some cheap fabric, a lot of vinyl everywhere, very little leather, and it just doesn't feel anywhere near as special or as handcrafted as it actually is. And it's such a disappointment. Audi, I think, really needed to have tried just a little bit harder with what is, after all, their signature car. This is their flagship supercar. It's the vehicle which is supposed to represent what the company can do. And I know they can do better. And now we come to the best bit about the R8 rear wheel drive, the price. The current range topping V10 performance carbon black will set you back around £160,000 RRP. This precise car, as specified, is over £40,000 less at 117000 of your earth pounds. As supercars go, that's absolutely nothing. Uh, let's put that into some perspective, shall we? A well-specified 911 Carrera 2S is gonna set you back about the same. An Aston Martin Vantage, well, they start at 117 grand, and you do need to add quite a few options to those. Ferrari haven't sold you a car this cheap for about two decades. Honda won't sell you an NSX for anywhere near this money, and even Lamborghini will charge you about another 60 grand for their rear-wheel drive version of the Huracan, which has the same chassis and engine. This thing is a supercar bargain. It is the last of a dying breed, naturally aspirated, high-revving wondrousness. And yet, I don't think anyone's really gonna buy one. Why is that? Well, let's talk about it on the road. It certainly isn't for the way that it drives. Now, supercar bores may be quick to point out that this is indeed a, a little bit slower than some of its more expensive brethren. But the fact is this, in the real world, any car with a top speed of around 200 mile an hour and a 0 to 60 dash that begins with a three is seriously quick. You get this thing wound up and it will fly. Uh, let's just remember, the old V10 had 525 horsepower before it was then upgraded to the Plus variant. This is not far off that, and the rear-wheel drive configuration means that the GT aside, this is one of the lightest R8s ever made. Claimed weight is just shy of 1,600 kilos. Of course, people will then be happy to say that, well, that's nowhere near as light as a McLaren and they'd be right. Or that it doesn't steer quite as well as a McLaren either. That's also true. And this interior is way short of even perhaps the Aston Vantage and definitely a far cry from any Ferrari I've been in. But that, you see, is to miss the point entirely. this car is, is an awful lot of fun, but it's also multi-talented. It is an R8 in the best possible sense. Now, the damping on this car is passive. There are no options to alter it. In fact, the drive select button down here is somewhat redundant. There are only three parameters that you can change. You can alter the aggressiveness of the engine and gearbox. You can change the sound of the exhaust, and you can also alter the steering weighting. In truth, the steering is at its best in comfort. It's how I expect a mid-engine supercar to feel. Putting it in dynamic just adds a little bit of weight that I think does actually rob the car of a little bit of tactility. 
the engine and gearbox, even in comfort mode, are more than capable. In fact, shifts are really quick, regardless of whether you're in normal or sport mode. This dual clutch gearbox really is sensational. The only option I ever want in dynamic is the one for exhaust noise. This car is equipped with the obligatory petrol particulate filter. And no, it's not as raucous as the R8s of old, but because it is a 5.2 litre naturally aspirated V10, it still sounds ruddy good. This is a great engine. It spins so freely and happily too. And if you put your foot down at two or 3,000 RPM, you're used to something with serious turbocharged torque, then it will disappoint. But again, that's just not what these things were ever about. You've got to get this thing to at least 4,000 RPM before it wants to go. And then from six to about eight and a half, it's absolutely savage. Sometimes when you drive a car whose engine has been deliberately detuned, they can wind up feeling a little bit flat. They may say lack the top end fireworks of the full fat version. This doesn't really seem like it. You are getting the genuine V10 experience here. It's wonderful. As a practical proposition, the R8 is a bit of a mixed bag. As already demonstrated, storage space is not great. You've got the very small fruit and you've got a little parcel shelf behind you. That means that I can just about fit my camera kit in here and um, that's it, no more. It's unfortunate really, because actually it's got some decent credibility as a bit of a mile muncher. I've done quite a few large trips in the car this week already, and it's been brilliant. Road noise is not too intrusive, in fact I think it's better than in a 911, and that's due to the way the cars are laid out. The B&O stereo system is actually half decent. You've got little speakers in the headrest, although they don't seem to work quite as well as those in my ancient Honda S2000. And the newer versions of this car have Android Auto and Apple CarPlay as well, which means that you can do pretty much everything you need to. Plug your phone in, press the button, and off you go. Really is as simple as you could possibly want it. The suspension tuning is apparently bespoke to the rear wheel drive, and I believe they've made it just a touch softer. That being said, it's not really a night and day difference between this and say the V10 performance that I drove last year. It does confuse me that it's only in the absolute top spec carbon black that Magride becomes standard in this car. Indeed, 13 years ago, Magride was considered a must have option on the original V8 R8. So why it's still optional on this, I do not know. At low speeds, there's still a bit of firmness and jitteriness to the suspension, but as you'll see in a moment, when you start to press on, this car does make an awful lot of sense. As you might imagine, it doesn't quite have the sure-footedness of the Quattro-driven cars, but that does bring a different dynamic to it. It means that you start to respect this car a little bit more. Dare I say it, you perhaps even fear it a touch more. There is a passive mechanical differential at the back, which, does work, but if you try launch control or anything else in here, you will start to squirm around. This is a lively car when it wants to be, believe me. But even at the bargain price of £117,000, this thing as a supercar still has a very important job. It's got to put a real smile on your face. So does it. Absolutely. Now the oft-cited Achilles heel of the R8 is usually its steering. 
and this isn't a perfect car. No, if steering feel is what you're after, I'd suggest you look straight for a McLaren. They are pretty much the best in business, unless you're happy with the Lotus, of course. It is very direct, just as I found in the V10 Performance. And I would say, you'll have to give me some leeway here though, because it's been over a year since I drove that car, that it's a little bit better weighted too. I think it's a touch more interactive than in the bigger car. It means you have just that little bit more confidence to press on. It's still some way short of the very best systems. It's not a car you can simply jump in and go stupidly fast, but over time you do begin to learn it and it will talk to you. There is an entertaining dance to be had between the front and rear end, because no longer can you rely on the front to just grip and go when traction becomes an issue. That means that in scenarios like this, where the farmer has deposited mud all over the road, you have to exercise even more caution than normal. But you see, for me, it wasn't actually the steering that ruined the last R8 I drove. It was the brakes. The big carbon ceramics on the V10 Performance I found to be very grabby. You'd just about get used to them, you'd then relax for a moment, and the next time you pressed on them, you'd shoot through the windscreen. Here, no such problems. These wavy steel items are night and day better than the ceramics. They've got no issue bringing the car to a stop. In fact, its traction is by far the biggest issue today. And the feel is superb. The gearbox is absolutely brilliant. Genuinely one of the best and up there with Porsche's PDK and other similar systems. Unfortunately, the paddles are just awful. They are what I can only describe as tiny plastic tabs. In an RS3, I would deem these unacceptable. In a flagship supercar, they are bang out of order. I don't know who at Audi okayed these, but they are not okay. Many of the fast Audis that I've driven recently have been items with the big 4-litre turbocharged V8. And in many ways, I'm pretty sure those would be a much more effective way of getting down a road like this, certainly in these conditions. The most recent that I had was the RS7. Now, the RS7 had a big problem. The way the whole thing was set up, it would want to do one of two things, either trundle along gently and reasonably slowly, or go to absolute full attack. That stage between 3 tenths and 7 tenths appeared to be entirely missing from the car. That's just the way that it was set up. The engine was quite boosty and you could never really just make reasonable progress. Doing this sort of stuff, for example, in the RS7, very, very difficult. In here, much easier. It's got that you don't have to give the absolute beans to really enjoy still. And the best thing about a supercar, any supercar, is the fact that you don't have to drive them that quickly to get the experience. In fact, if you think that going fast is what a supercar is all about, I'm afraid we can't be friends because it just isn't. It never has been. There have always been cars which have been just as quick as a supercar and a lot cheaper. My favoriteest supercar ever is a Ferrari 355. Back in the late 90s, I'm pretty convinced down this road, a hot Impreza would have given it a very bloody nose. But you know what? I like the Impreza. I really, really like the Impreza. But that's not a supercar, is it? That's not a car that drives me absolutely wild. The Ferrari very much is. And I have to feel sorry for Audi because this in so many ways is the least Audi car you could possibly imagine. Of all the companies to still be making a naturally aspirated 8,500 RPM V10 engine and sticking it in something like this, you'd never, ever have Audi down for doing that. I can say with some authority that a modern Ferrari 488 or any equivalent McLaren is a much faster car. They are, in many ways, more of a supercar. But the R8 does have a little dailyable edge to it. It has cup holders, they work. It's reasonably comfortable. 
these seats I'm not in love with. I prefer the buckety items. I think they're just as comfortable and much more supportive, but these are not bad. The steering wheel is brilliant, same as pretty much any other hot Audi. I love the fact that they keep the rim fairly thin and you've got nice physical buttons exactly where you want them. Doing whatever you need in this car is dead easy. They haven't decided to put the indicators on the roof or do anything crazy or silly. It's a really nice compromise. I've got the controls I need, where I need them, where I want them. This is really a very easy car to live with, but not one I think that suffers for doing so. As you will see over the next few weeks, I flip constantly between preferring the later or earlier versions of the R8. And indeed, coming up very soon, you've got a review of an early R8 V10 with the manual gearbox, which I'd say if you're a real petrol head is probably one of the other R8s that would appeal most. And that indeed has many things about it, which I do prefer over this. I think it felt perhaps a little bit more special inside. The gearbox, of course, is a joy. A big V10 naturally aspirated engine with a manual gearbox, oh, yes, please. And the steering is just that bit better too. But this, I think, is by far the best driving of all of the current R8s that I've been in. And at no point, honestly, no point in the last week and a half and 2,000 miles that I've done have I really thought, you know what, I've, actually, I wish they'd given me the V10 performance. You know, I, I really need that extra 80 horsepower this thing is fine absolutely fine no it's more than fine it's sublime so why why isn't anyone gonna buy it uh, here's my reasoning first off people are suckers for numbers and they'll look at this and go oh yeah i could get that or i could go and get the quattro which will be a little bit quicker again or i could get the performance or the performance carbon black and before you know it you're spending hundred and sixty thousand pounds the biggest problem is the fact that when I checked Auto Trader the other day I saw that there were many examples of said V10 performance carbon black available at very very hefty discounts you could pick one of those up for about hundred and thirty grand that's a silly deal and the reason for that, I suspect, is the fact that Audi have committed the cardinal sin. You see, they've obviously been building cars without customers waiting for them at the other end. I saw something which was more or less the same as this, just a different colour, and they were asking £105,000 for a car with delivery miles on. That is a ludicrous bargain. Please, someone buy it before Audi realise what a terrible mistake they made selling these things so cheap. I also expect that actually many people who would be potential customers of this are simply going to go and buy something used and honestly I don't blame you for doing that because you are always going to get a lot more for your money. For less than the price you'd pay for a new one of these you could have a Ferrari F430, might even be able to get a manual one and that is a very special car. You could have yourself a, a used Vantage, not a supercar granted, but a very nice car. You could get an old 911 Turbo, a GT3, anything of that ilk. But if you are tempted by an R8, please do me a favour. There is a branch of Audi called Exclusive, and they are the people that can do very special things to a car. They can paint it in pretty much whatever colour you like, and they can also do a proper interior. I've seen some of the vehicles that they've put together, and believe me, they are night and day different. The silliest thing is that going to Audi Exclusive isn't actually that expensive. The prices they charge are pretty reasonable when you look at what McLaren or Ferrari or anybody else charge for the same things. If I was going to buy a supercar, I think I'd give real serious consideration to buying one of these, a rear-wheel drive, because it's all I need, and spending the extra money not on getting a higher-end version, but on putting a special colour on the outside, decking the interior out in leather, and then you're going to have something truly unique, really special, but practical, usable, and ultimately enjoyable. The R8 rear-wheel drive has really genuinely impressed me. I think it is by far my favourite current Audi, and I'm very glad to have been able to spend a little bit of extra time with it, because it really has grown on me. 
This car is almost certain to reappear on the channel in the next couple of weeks, and I hope in the meantime that you enjoy all of the other content that we've got coming. So as always, all I have to say for now is thanks for watching, please like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you all for the next one. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.